Stinging, all the little bees in twos and threes, buzzing in the sun all day. section we're going to have a look at uh, a little bit about strip flying and performance. Now strip flying can be great fun. Basically the Moth series aircraft are capable of fairly short takeoff and landing and being able to operate into strips opens up a whole new dimension of aviation. Of course that's what they were really made for back in the 20s and 30s. But particularly for those of you coming from uh, more modern aircraft, there are a few hang-ups and catches to keep your eye out for. First of all, most strips are privately owned, so prior permission is required. Do make sure that you've contacted the landowner or the farmer or the airfield operator and they're happy for you to come. Now it's always worth wrecking a strip before, whether that be from the ground or by talking to other people who have used the airfield. Strips create their own hazards. Remember they don't have the same protection as what a licensed airfield would have in terms of the uh, availability of the runway, the sizes of it and the obstructions and obstacles. So here are just some of the hazards that we can see when we go to a strip. In many ways it's very much similar to what our forced landing bit considers. Can you remember the size, the shape, the slope, the surface and the surrounds because each of those will vary from strip to strip. Some are beautifully kept very long and wide strips, others are quite short farm strips and may well be very narrow with cut-offs at the edges where the plough has cut. If you go off the edge of that strip you may well turn the aircraft over. The slope of the strip, quite a few strips actually have significant slopes, some you can only land in one way and go out the other. Some of them have a sideways slope and that can give a particular problem to a moth with no brakes and limited steering where the aircraft actually wants to career down the side of the strip and is not as controllable as more modern aircraft. The surface makes a considerable difference. The difference between short grass and long grass makes a tremendous difference to both the takeoff run and the landing run. As indeed does the time of the year. If the ground or the grass is wet, there's considerably more drag than on short grass, which is hard. In fact, in short grass that's really hard on a down slope, sometimes it's impossible to stop a tiger moth even with the throttler idle. So extreme caution is required. A lot of strips have obstructions near them whether they be trees in the approach or the overrun area, cables in the vicinity and farm buildings. Also beware a lot of scripts are used by modelers as well so make sure that you know what is planned and what goes on and how the strip is run that you're intending to visit. In reality 
What I would urge you to do is to do a strip flying course, either with the LAA, who provide the specialist coaches to go and do it, or with somebody with a similar experience so that you can build up your knowledge, rather than treating it as something rather that you're teaching yourself. For there are a lot of hazards and quite a few aircraft are broken on strips. Now, when we've, having spoken to our landowner or PPI airfield operator and arrived over there, our next big consideration is going to be wind. Which way are we going to land? And that can be a difficult one because invariably we want to land into wind with a moth, so as close to into wind as possible. But on a few very sharp, very sharp steep strips, it can be better to actually land up a steep hill. Having arrived over it and decided which way we're going to land, if there's nobody else operating, then it's a good idea to actually fly down low along the strip and inspect it. Quite often the farm strips have wires out, farm wires for livestock. They're almost impossible to see and usually suspended on little uh, plastic stakes about uh, waist high. They're often coloured green or yellow and the very thin sheet wire that runs between them is impossible to see from the air. So look out for those sorts of obstructions. Look at the surface, make sure there's nothing else being put out there. Don't do it so low that you provide a hazard, but do fly up the strip low enough to do your strip inspection such that you can be confident that the strip is clear. Now this brings us to an interesting bit of the 500 foot rule. Because technically, you're actually in breach of that 500 foot rule when you do a low fly past. If you were to roll the wheels straight away, bizarrely, though it may be bad aviation practice, you'd actually be the right side of the law. But the Civil Aviation Authority assure me that providing that the fly past inspection is done in a, an airman-like manner, for, and at the end of the day this is in the, absolutely in the interest of the safe operation of your aircraft, then they are quite happy that you fly the aircraft like that and back up into the circuit. Of course this is not, definitely not, an excuse that you can use if you then perform a few alien rolls and a beat up. So let's clarify that. When operating into a licensed airfield, the operator will make sure that the runway is clear. But when flying into a strip, as commander of the aircraft it is your responsibility to make sure that the strip is clear and safe for your operation. So. The CA are quite happy that in accordance with normal general aviation practice that you fly, do a low fly past inspection and make sure that the strip is clear of obstacles and the surface is fit for your operation. Then climb up into the circuit and fly the aircraft normally. Strips are PPR or prior permission required. So when you get that permission, tell the strip or landowner that you will be doing a fly pass to make sure that the airfield is safe for your operation and then it won't come as a surprise to anybody. We're going to have a look at a few pictures of strips here. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some are beautifully laid out as per this one here, a long strip on flat ground. Others have been laid on farms that have required various hedges to be removed and provide narrowing points and similarly obstructions at either ends of the strip. Most farmers have areas that they'd like you to avoid or are noise sensitive or have cattle in them so make sure that you know what the drill is before you arrive. Some strips are difficult to actually see where the landing area is from the air and here's one along the top of a ridge with drops at either end so think sink. Another interesting strip here is buried in deep woodland. It actually rises from the left to the right hand side of this picture, but the tall trees around it mean that you may well get lots of curl over, sink or on hot day thermals. Many airfields and strips have their details published in such publications as the Pooley's Flight Guide and the Flying Farmer's Guides. Remember to study them thoroughly talk to the landowner and get a good brief before you get to actually fly into or out of a strip. Other considerations include the state of the strip. 
That will vary depending on the time of the year. Is the grass short or is it long? Long grass equals drag, bad for taking off, but good for stopping. Summer means hard grass, so again good for taking off, but bad for stopping. Have you considered your own abilities and your recency? And what about the performance of your aircraft? Are you trying to take off and land or too small a strip? Or is the aircraft capable of doing it with sensible safety margins? We're going to go and have a look now at flying at a strip at Paul Groves uh, one at Exton, which is in the Mion Valley. Uh, you can see the strip there. We're basically looking northwards and Paul's flying across the strip having a good look at it. Uh, it rises from the east towards the west, so towards the left hand edge of the picture it's climbing up. Uh, it is an interesting time of the day due to the sun setting. So always have a good look around your strip to start with when you arrive. This particular one has an avoid about one field off the western edge there's a golf club which uh, needs to be avoided. So let's go down and uh, land and have a look at the strip itself. Well it's a nice strip, the grass is reasonably short, it's just after harvest time and you'll be able to see stubble there. There is very little rutting between the edge of the strip here and the crop itself. This can be a real hazard if it's, or when it's ploughed due to the fact that it leaves a large plough groove which if you were to come off the edge of the strip you'll probably turn the aircraft over. Uh, so it's really important to avoid that. Uh, even so, with this little dent as we come off the strip, if you were to come off sideways, you may well risk dinging a wing tip as the aircraft exits the strip, and lifting the aileron may just be enough to get you away from uh, cashing the aileron as the aircraft exits the strip. But certainly with uh, any more grooving than this, it's essential to stay on there and not ground loop it. Here we are at Exton Strip. It's quite an interesting one this evening. We've got about five knots of crosswind coming from the left here. The scenario normally would be to preferably land into wind uphill, but this evening um, we've got a, a sunset going on, which means any landing into sun is going to be quite obscure. Uh, and obviously we've got a crosswind component, which is going to tend to drift off the strip into sun. It's going to be difficult to keep your eye on the runway centre line. Uh, so the dilemma is, do you then land downhill out of sun better approach but of course you're landing downhill in a nil wind component. You can see here the sun right in line with the runway. So we're going to go and fly an approach from both ends of the strip uh, to give you an idea of the problems that you're going to encounter. So here's Paul just about to take off downhill and down sun and you can see we've got a great view. We're making this video just to show you the sort of things that you might come across on what otherwise seems to be an absolutely beautiful flying evening. Of course the options are not to fly at all or to go to somewhere where the runway is out of sun or if you're coming back from somewhere and find yourself right into sun landing you may well want to hold off for 5 or 10 minutes until the sun has set but don't leave it for too long as you start to lose depth perception as it gets darker. So, turning around to the right, we've got a great field there if we need it for forced landings. But we're going to now turn around, avoiding the uh, local villages and noise sensitive areas, and make our approach. So, here we are coming in towards our strip facing westwards at the moment we can see things well but I think as you find that we get into the flare life is not easy the camera does exaggerate the problem somewhat but you get the idea that this is a difficult direction to land in Indeed, Paul does the sensible thing, applies full power and overshoots. He's turning around to the right because there's a golf course that we must avoid off the end of the runway. 
bars, one field off the end. So we're going to climb away now and set up for an approach from the other end. While we're climbing away, you can see the smoke from the corn, should I say dust, from the combine harvesters, and they give a great idea of what the wind's doing. So always use natural sources to act as a wind sock. So we're now set up on left base, and Paul starts turning in on his approach. Here you see the problem of the downhill. He's also probably slightly fast and he lands well into the strip. The chances of stopping are a bit dodgy, so he does the sensible thing and overshoots, climbing away for another approach. This time Paul flies a similar approach, but with very accurate speed control. This enables him to place the aircraft exactly where he wants it to touch down and stop the aircraft with lots of strip remaining. So these are all things to ponder before you commit to operating into a strip. This brings us on to the subject of performance. Have a look at this little video clip and see what you think. Wise. Right, well for an American aircraft then of course they produce all sorts of nice graphs and tables and we can go into those and produce takeoff run and takeoff distances that are required and then factor them. If you remember, if, you go into, if you've learned to fly an American aeroplane then you'll be used to producing those numbers and by the time you factored them they probably come out at about twice the original length that you want. If you want to update yourself with the performance increments, then you'll find them in the back of lasers, which has the whole safety sense leaflets at the back, but also they're issued separately. And number seven looks at takeoff and landing performance for both landing and takeoff roll. If you look in the table here, you'll see that a 10% increase in passenger weight increases by 20% your takeoff roll. An increase of a thousand foot in aerodrome elevation increases your roll by another 10%. An increase in 10 degrees C is another 10%. If you look at the bottom left of the table, you'll see that on dry grass, that's up to 8 inches on firm soil, will increase your takeoff roll by 20% compared with being on a hard runway. But on wet grass, up to 8 inches, it increases by 30%. Now each of these factors needs to be multiplied up and then multiplied by the takeoff run that is uh, issued or form a performance table. So as you can see very quickly you end up with double the original takeoff roll requirement from what you can expect on a hard runway. Now there are no proper scheduled performance takeoff or indeed landing figures for the Tiger Moth. And I am very hesitant to give you any here. And the reasons of this is that the takeoff performance varies remarkably with the temperature, the all up weight of the aircraft. The aircraft is that all these moths, as they get towards the maximum weight, their performance degrades remarkably. It depends obviously on the wind, the slope, and the length of the grass and the condition of the grass that you're taking off on, and indeed the pilot technique. But not only to that, our Tiger Moths are fitted with a variety of engine propeller combinations and obviously a fine pitch propeller is going to get off the ground remarkably quicker than a very coarse cruise only propeller. So you need to get to know your aeroplane on a big strip and get a feel for what it actually performs like. 
and then use the correct piloting technique to get airborne. Always have in the back of the mind these additional performance factors and what is different today to what it was last time you took off. Now in the past some people have made some really really big errors. Yes the aircraft might be able to get off in or land in a couple of hundred yards but that's it a couple of hundred yards that's not a farm field that's 200 yards long with fields with uh, hedges either end of it. So don't try and get into ridiculously small places. Remember, you've got an excellent little aircraft, but use it sensibly. You can see from this little sketch here, on the top is a strip that's just got small fences, and most of the strip is actually available for taking off and landing. But put a significantly high obstacle at either end, and suddenly the available strip actually reduces to about half its length. If the ground is bumpy, it is possible for the aircraft to be bounced into the air prematurely. Do not try and haul the aircraft away at slow speed as you actually got high drag and the aircraft will not accelerate. Accept the bump, let it bounce back onto the ground and let it fly away naturally at its correct speed. Let's consider some other things that we might see on a strip. What about trees in the approach? Well, if you look at the trees, the air will rise on the upwind slope and descend on the other side. So whenever you see trees in short finals, think sink and turbulence downwind of them. You'll get a similar effect as you approach any high trees at the takeoff end of your strip. Quite often you'll find strips on a hill. Again, beware, as the air descends off the end of the strip towards you and during approach, it will be sinking. You'll need a lot more power than you would normally to motor into the strip and counteract that sink. While we're on performance, I'm going to have a little look at a couple of bits that you may or may not have seen before. And what I'm going to do is to use a cardboard cutout to simulate our runway. So initially, I'd like you to have a look at the cardboard cutout. And you, I'll put it at an angle that you're likely to see when you're flying an approach to a standard runway. And it would probably look something like that. I'm now going to replace it with another runway of absolutely the same length, but this time it's going to be a field. It's positioned in exactly the same place, it's a little bit crinkly at that end, so I'll turn it round to this end. So, I positioned it in exactly the same place, but can you see that you, it looks wider, the runway looks shorter, and so with this wider runway, you actually feel closer to the touchdown area than you were on the previous one. And that's the effect of perspective. Of course, also, if I go back to my start first one, you're used to use looking at the runway and judging its angle, whether it becomes more rectangular like that, so look as if you're steep, feel as if you're steep, and similarly, as it goes flatter, you can see that it shallows and that's how you gain a perspective even if you're not aware of it subconsciously of your glide slope. But remember that's just for if it's on a flat surface. But if the strip is on a hillside you may well actually have it like that and it looks like you're quite high and it's quite a steep approach. Of course relative to the angle of the ground it will be but as I've got it set up here in fact the touchdown zone is almost exactly level with you. So instead of flying a maybe five degree approach down, you're flying level. So you will need significantly more power and decrease power pretty well to take you into the touchdown area. Conversely, of course, if it's on a slight down slope, and I don't advise this in a Tiger unless you've got a significant strong headwind, then you'll be flying a slightly shallow approach in the glide and therefore you'll need less power. So beware of those changes of aspect. It's the same runway, but the angle makes it all look different and the amount of power that you're going to need will be different. So a few things to ring warning bells in your head that if you hear of a short strip, a sloping strip, significant crosswinds, very hard, short grass, or conversely in the winter, very long, wet grass, get some warning bells, or you're at max, high maximum all up weight. 
have a few warning bells going in your brain that this may require special attention and maybe it's a good idea to stay clear of that strip today. Strip flying is great fun, particularly in moths, so enjoy it, but always think about performance. Your abilities, are you capable in the conditions that are of the day, and the aircraft's performance to actually get airborne or land in the conditions that you're asking it to. It's very easy for us as individuals to quite often become focused on the goal of taking off and landing, whereas if we spend a couple of minutes standing back, we might look at things in a slightly different way or decide to do things in a different way. Always remember, particularly upon landing, that an overshoot, as it was called in old money, or a go around, is usually good value. Have a look at this clip. I hope. What do you think the pilot was concentrating on here? It wasn't his landing or stopping performance, but remember, this error could be made by you or I. Seems like I just gotta stop. Whoa.